You're on, Savannah? Yep. And you're going to follow it around so you can see the board, too? Yep. There you go. Marked His word. I know. I accidentally marked it. I don't know how to get it off. Can't see it. Can't see it with the screen on. The screen's white. It makes me so mad. Wait, where's the line? You can't see it. Thank you. What? Can you see it when it's like that? Uh, yeah, it's right there. There's one on the right side. Oh, it's on the right side. Right side. Oh. Yeah.
for the bacteria, not fast for us. Yeah. Moving one millimeter for a bacterium is like going across the country for us. So these things are real small. Let's see how they move around. Most local bacteria move by means of flagellum. A flagellum is a slender structure about 15 to 20 microns long and about 20 nanometers wide. A typical rod-shaped bacterial cell is 2 to 3 microns in length. The bacterial flagellum is composed of three parts. The basal body, which is embedded in the cell membrane and wall, a short curved segment called the hook, and the portion that extends out from the cell called the filament. The basal body consists of rings that correspond to the layers of the cell envelope and therefore differ in gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria. In most gram-negative bacteria, there are four rings connected to a central rod. Gram Let me pause this right now. He's talking about gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria, which are two of the types of bacteria out there. Gram-positive bacteria, it's called gram because there's a special kind of stain that you use to stain bacteria. It's called gram stain. Dang it. Do we need to know all this stuff? Nah, you don't need to know all this stuff. Do we just need to know it's for locomotion? Yeah, it's used for locomotion. It's just kind of tells you how it's used. Anyway, a gram positive bacteria is a bacteria where the gram stain, a special type of stain this guy made, will stick to gram-positive bacteria, so they'll, they'll positively stain. The gram-negative bacteria won't be stained by this special stain. It looks like ink, you know, you just drop it on the gram-negative bacteria and they won't take it up. And the reason why is gram-positive bacteria have this layer of, of stuff in their cell wall called peptidoglycan. And the peptidoglycan absorbs the stain. But the peptidoglycan layer in a gram-negative bacteria is thinner and underneath an outer membrane made of fat. And the stain will hit that outer membrane made of fat and just roll off the bacteria. It will not be able to make it to the peptidoglycan layer before it or underneath it. So back in the old days, scientists didn't know about this peptidoglycan layer and didn't know there was an outer membrane, and they just knew that some bacteria stained with the gram stain and some didn't. So scientists had divided all the bacteria up into gram-negative bacteria and gram-positive bacteria based on the two types of, of cell walls that they have. EKF, I think this might be one of the reasons you're not understanding some of this stuff, because you're laying down during the discussion. So, uh, obviously, long ago in bacterial evolution, some organisms evolved that had a, um, an extra layer over the peptidoglycan, and those are your gram negatives. Gram positive bacteria have only two basal body rings one connected to the cell membrane, and the other to the cell wall. Motility is mediated by proteins associated with the plasma membrane and basal body and is powered by the proton motive force associated with the plasma membrane. The filament is a rigid structure which rotates to move the bacterial cell. Spirochetes are motile by means of bundles of flagellum called axial fibrils that run along the cell within the periplasmic space. The number of fibrils varies. These axial fibrils extend from both ends of the cell within a flexible outer sheath. Spirochetes have a screw-like motion which allows them to bore into mucoid layers and soft agar media. Some bacteria lack flagella or axial fibrils, but are motile if they are in contact with a solid surface. This type of movement is referred to as gliding motility. For some gliding bacteria, secretion of a slimy polysaccharide appears to be involved. Other bacteria appear to have special proteins on their surfaces that mediate gliding motility. <coughs> Say what? <laughs> this shows bacterial uh, reproduction 
which is a special process that you should know. It's called um, uh, blah. Can't think of the name. Binary fission. Binary fission, thank you. Binary fission. And so I have some binary fission video. What do our Bacteria and archaea. Yeah, both of them. Prokaryote. <laughs> Shows them going pretty quick. Bacteria reproduce very simply and rapidly by doubling their contents and splitting in two. Just one bacterium, dividing every 20 minutes, could produce nearly 5,000 billion billion bacteria in one day. So that's under perfect conditions. Perfect temperature, plenty of food. See, they're actually living on top of the food that they eat. This auger. These are bacteria on auger. So they'll reproduce like crazy. They'll also do this on food that you just leave out. I mean, if you leave a sandwich laying out, there'll be bacteria multiplying like this on it. And in a few days, you won't be able to eat the sandwich. It will be spoiled. So what happens if you like leave something out and then eat the next morning? Well, it probably won't be able to multiply that much in one day. So see, this might be, this might be a few. Ooh. Uh, this is, again, this is perfect conditions. If it's warmer, they multiply quicker. So if you just leave a, something out for a day, you may still be able to eat it, depending on what it is. Um, one way you can reduce the multiplication of these bacteria is to refrigerate your food. Put it in a cold area, and the bacteria won't multiply that quickly. Put it in the freezer, and the bacteria won't multiply at all, because they need water, and all the water's frozen, you see. So food can be saved indefinitely if it's frozen. Another thing you can do is you can take your food and put it in a can and stop it up, or, or, a, or a bottle or a mason jar or something, stop it up and heat it up so hot it kills all the bacteria in there. Scientists have figured out you have to heat it to 121 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes, or for 18, 20 minutes or something like that. And that will kill every bacteria. And then no bacteria can get in there because it's in the jar. So it, it'll keep for indefinitely, really, unless something happens to your jar or a can. Yes? So what is salt preserve stuff? Okay. Bacteria can't reproduce well in salt, salty environments, too. There's a few types that can, called halophiles, but most of them can't. So if you keep it salty and you keep it dry, they need water, too. Yeah. What? You you can't have bacteria growing in it either. That's what making like that's what beef jerky's all about. Beef jerky can survive. Can you can eat it even years later because it's so salty and it's so dry. That's good. Yeah. What about honey? Honey doesn't go bad. Different. It crystallizes. That's a good question. I'm not sure why honey doesn't go bad. Maybe it's too much sugar. A bee farmer. It might be too hypertonic. And the, the cells just break up. <laughs> Bacteria normally reproduce by binary fission, a process in which a cell divides to produce two equal sized cells identical to the parent. The cell wall pinches in and eventually separates the two daughter cells. Binary fission is quick, and you get growth on a plate. And this at the bottom, these are colonies. They've basically taken their bacteria and spread them out. You can see how you spread them out. We tried to do this in our lab. Some of y'all got better results than others. And here at the bottom, they're growing in individual colonies. That colony is the growth from a single bacterium that ended up right there on that plate and grew over a few days into a whole colony. A colony might consist of billions of bacteria, but they're all clones of the original bacteria that was there. Why are some things uh, able to spoil faster than others? Um, it depends. A, a lot depends on their consistency. It's, you know, if it's a liquid and, and it's uh, easy for the bacteria to move and get from one place to another inside, it'll spoil quicker. You know, so it just depends on the food item. Yes, Emery. Um. When the bacteria reproduce and they like have form colonies, is the, are the colonies all the same? The um, same bacteria that reproduced? Not necessarily, because what you did was you probably took some original bacteria from Modules. somewhere else that are different. And you spread them out on this plate. Modules. So the bacteria that ended up here 
It's, it's probably different from the little bit different from the bacteria that ended up there. So you have this col all of these in this colony are basically the same. They're descended from a single bacteria here. And all of the bacteria from this colony are basically the same. They're descended from a single bacteria. And on the one that grew like all over? Yeah. That's just so many bacteria that it, that they all grow together and form a lot. Because they couldn't didn't have anything to stop the growing. Right? Yeah. And down here there was nothing to stop the growing either. We just spread them out so that they're they're more spread out. See the population is higher here, the original population that you put on the plate. The population is lower down here. See, we threw we threw thousands of bacteria here. Then we used our loop to spread them out so there's only hundreds here. And then we used our loop to spread them out more and so there's only, you know, 30 or 40 down here. Does that make sense, Emery? Yes. You just seem like you went to sleep on me at the last period. I got it. Yeah. And yeah, what is the exact difference between how um, bacteria divide and how, like, you, um, eukaryotic cells are? Well, a eukaryotic cell. Uh, it has first bigger chromosomes, so it takes longer to copy them. Yeah. And eukaryotic cells go through those stages of mitosis we learned, prophase, where the chromosomes line up and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, metaphase, anaphase, when they separate. There's two sister chromatids and all that. You don't have to go through all those steps in a in a okay. prokaryote. It's just one loop chromosome. Okay. You don't have to, you don't have a number of chromosomes. So that loop chromosome just copies itself? The loop chromosome copies itself. Um, and then it forms two cells. I used to have a video on how that happened. So that's just what binary, binary fission is, is just a reproduction of a... Of a prokaryotic cell. Okay. Yeah. This is a really random question. Okay, is there anything that, like, is there any time when bacteria decide, like, it's too crowded. Like if you put them in a jar, would they stop reproducing. They stop they reproducing when they get too crowded. Okay. Mm -hmm. But if you like heat it up or something, would they keep reproducing? Well, they have to have food, oh. and they have to have um, uh, enough water. And if they have enough food and water, they can still reproduce. But also, there's a problem when they're crowded of waste. If you're getting rid of your waste, you're getting rid of it onto your neighbor because he's right there, and he's getting rid of his waste onto you. That stops the growth. We call that a limiting factor, a, a weight that limits their growth. They start growing as soon as they start pooping on each other. And they start, yeah, once they poop on each other, they're, gonna, they're not going to be able to do too well, so they don't grow very fast. How come you can't, like, if you, like, leave your soup out and then it, like, has too much bacteria on it and, like, spoils, how come you can't, like, heat it up and kill the bacteria? You can. It will be okay? Yeah. You can recook it, get it hot enough that it kills all the bacteria, then you can eat it again. It wouldn't taste the same. It wouldn't taste good because bacteria are producing waste products that go into the soup, and then you'll be eating bacteria waste products. But yeah, you could you eat it without getting eat? infected. Mm -hmm. so, so there's nothing wrong with eating bacteria? It, it, it depends on the type of bacteria. Some bacteria produce poisons, okay. and, and which, which that could end up hurting you. So you probably shouldn't eat that soup. I wouldn't recommend it. No. But it wouldn't be impossible. You can still get the carbon from it, the calories. Now, let's talk about three types of genetic recombination in bacteria. This is important to the uh, AP Bio test. They, they're real big on these. First one is conjugation. Conjugation is bacteria sex. Two bacteria come together and they do it. And they trade DNA. Let's watch that happen here. Genetic recombination means switching up the genes in the bacteria. Why is this not there? What's that? Conjugation is a mechanism of gene transfer that requires direct contact between donor and recipient cells. Oh, I see. A plasmid is a small piece of DNA, separate from the main chromosome, that carries genetic information for such things as antibiotic resistance. The first step in plasma transfer is contact watch between him. the donor and the recipient. EKF, watch him. The pillus of the donor cell recognizes and binds to specific receptor sites on the cell wall of the recipient cell. <laughs> the plasmid then becomes mobilized for transfer when an enzyme cleaves one strand of the plasmid at a specific nucleotide sequence called the origin of transfer. 
logic cuts A it. single strand of the plasmid, beginning at the origin of transfer, enters the recipient cell. Once inside the recipient cell, a complementary strand to the single DNA strand is synthesized. When donor and recipient cells are mixed together, eventually all of the cells become donors. Does the first one already have, the, did both of them already have well, the first one? Okay. Yeah. Th this, this already had a plasmid, and it wanted to give the plasmid to this one. So it copied its plasmid, basically, and passed it over. Basically. See, it, cu it, it, cuts, it cuts the plasmid open and then copies a piece. So it sends sharing. that copy over. And then when the copy's on the other side, the complementary DNA base pairs so are, are copied. So it's more like one... It's like giving. Yeah. Yeah, it's giving. It's not sharing. It's yeah, you're right. It's not sharing. It's giving. What was someone else had a question about... Earlier, someone back here, y'all were laughing right when I turned that on. Was there a question? I said it was science porn. Science <laughs> porn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Emory was saying that Emory was trying to ask him. I don't even want to know what I was thinking. He was like, that's not science porn. <laughs> okay, transformation. Bacteria picks up three pieces of DNA from the environment. This is what we did in our experiment. What bacteria will do if they feel they are in trouble is pick up pieces of DNA from their environment. Now, DNA could be laying all over the place from when organisms die. If a cell dies, their DNA spills out and it's laying there on the ground. And if another bacteria cup swims up to it, it can pick it up. And that, if that happens, that's a transformation. The experiment we did, we squirted a bunch of plasmids onto the bacteria, you see. And then we gave them a heat shock, and that scared them. And when you heat shot bacteria, they start picking up DNA from their environment. So some of them picked up the plasmid. Not all of them, some of them. And so that's a transformation, and it shows that going on right here. DNA transformation. Say that again? Is this all part of binary fission? No, none of this is binary fission. Okay. Binary fission is when the bacteria divide in two. This is, just this is genetic recombination in bacteria. It's how bacteria get DNA and trade DNA from one to another. Well, watch this now. DNA transformation involves the transfer of naked DNA into a recipient cell. In the first step, double-stranded donor DNA binds to specific receptors on the surface of a competent cell. One strand of the donor DNA is degraded by nucleases while the other strand enters the cell. Something's wrong right here. Let me try it again. DNA transformation involves the transfer of naked DNA into a recipient cell. In the first step, double-stranded donor DNA binds to specific receptors on the surface of a competent cell. One strand of the donor DNA is degraded by nucleases while the other strand enters the cell. The single-stranded donor DNA pairs with an homologous region on the recipient DNA and is integrated into the recipient genome by a breakage and reunion mechanism called homologous recombination. If there are any differences between the nucleotide sequences of the donor and recipient DNAs, the mismatch repair system comes into play. The repair system removes either the donor or the recipient strand and replaces it with the complementary sequence. Since either strand may be repaired, some cells contain the new donor DNA and others have the original DNA sequences. In the laboratory, cells are plated on selective media so that only the transformants will grow. Jump on that. <coughs> Basically, the bacteria took up DNA from its environment and sometimes that, that new DNA gets in their, in their chromosome, and sometimes it's removed, and sometimes it's not. Um, anyway, those are transformations. Finally, transductions. A transduction is when bacteria um, trade DNA through viruses, through phages. A vi Don't pack up yet, please. 
a virus can land on one bacteria and get DNA from it and deliver that DNA to a completely other bacterium. And we call that a transduction. So it's spread through viruses? Spread through viruses. So these are three different ways to share DNA. That's right. In generalized transduction, a Watch segment it. of DNA that's, is that's carried from one bacterial cell to another by a bacterial virus called a bacteriophage or phage. The phage attaches to the bacterial cell and injects its nucleic acid into the host cell. A phage enzyme is produced that breaks down the host DNA into smaller fragments. Phage DNA is replicated and phage coat proteins are produced. During formation of the mature phage particles, a few phage heads may surround fragments of bacterial DNA instead of phage DNA. The phage particle carrying the bacterial DNA infects another cell, transferring the bacterial DNA to the new cell. When the bacterial DNA is introduced into the new host cell, it can become integrated into the bacterial chromosome, thereby transferring genes to the recipient. This cell then multiplies and carries new genetic material. Did y'all see what happened there? I like the lytic. When it, yeah, in the lytic cycle, when it's making all its viruses, one of the viruses it made it didn't have viral DNA. It had some of the original cell's DNA in its capsule. And if that virus lands on another cell,